All right, everyone, so this is going to be the second video to tissue, and we're also going to cover the integumentary system um, in this video as well. Uh, integumentary system doesn't take very long. That's why we do it with the tissues. Uh, so this is what we would, or I would talk about in lab next class, but just so we have enough time for everybody to see all the different slides, I'm making this video as well, so you could watch it before coming in and get the information before you're coming in, and we could just spend the whole lab looking at slides. All right. So if you remember last class, you covered, or the last video, I talked about two other types of tissue, epithelium and connective tissue. Well, in this one, we're going to cover the other two types, which is muscle and uh, nerve tissue. All right, so with muscle tissue, there's three major types. So there's skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. And you find these in different locations of the body. <clears throat> okay, so identifying these. So I have slides of skeletal muscle for you to look at. Um, I think skeletal muscle is probably one of the easiest tissues to identify because the cells look so different than anything else. This is a single muscle cell right here. All right, they are very, very long. They are much longer than most of other cells in your body. And they also have this striation to them too. I don't know if you notice that here, we see all these little lines, that is striation. Those are lines of proteins inside the cell that is gonna be used for contraction. So those proteins will contract and actually sh shrink the cell this way. So uh, muscle cells or skeletal muscle cells are really long and tube-like, so we sometimes refer to them as muscle fiber. Um, so whenever you see the term muscle fiber, it's really just talking about a single skeletal muscle cell. Now these cells are super long, right? Um, so they need to still have access to the nucleus or the nucleus still needs to make proteins. Um, so to do this, you, you can't just have one nucleus in these very long cells. So you actually have multiple nuclei inside these cells. So we say they're multinucleated, and you can see all these nuclei here. There's multiple nuclei associated with each one of these cells, these very long cells here. And not only that, these nuclei are pushed off to the sarcolemma. The sarcolemma is a special name for the plasma membrane of muscle cells. And so all these nuclei are pushed off to that sarcolemma, that plasma membrane, to make room for all the striation, which are the contractile proteins, to this muscle. And again, so when these proteins act on each other, they're going to shrink that cell in its length. So we have this really long cell that can shrink into a pretty short cell um, when you're contracting your muscle. All right, so here's another slide of it, just to give you variation on what you might see. Um, so this is when you first put the slide under the microscope. Um, ignore stuff like this. This is usually connective tissue or scar tissue that is associated with a lot of these uh, um, other types of tissue. Here is the muscle tissue here, and you can see the individual muscle fibers here or muscle cells. So we're going to zoom into that. Um, when you get a little hard objective lens, you'll see the nuclei. The nuclei become more apparent, and you see that they're all, there's multiple nuclei because they're multinucleated, and they're all pushed off to that sarcolemma. And if you zoom all the way in, then you'll see those striations, those chains or lines of contractile proteins that will shrink this cell during contraction. And here you can see, again, these uh, nuclei pushed off to the periphery. All right, the next one is cardiac muscle. Very similar in some aspects to skeletal muscle, but also very different in other aspects. Um, so let me point out one cardiac muscle cell so you can see how it's different than the skeletal muscle. So we have one cell here it kind of makes this finger or branching pattern with its plasma membrane. So I'm outlining the cell right now. And it probably went away over here and then came over here. So it kind of it looks like this. Or it has these little fingers or projections that stick out of the cell. Um, these cells are not nearly as long as skeletal muscle cells either. They're short. And because they sh they're short, they only have one nucleus. They're uninucleated, like most other cells in your body. And that nucleus is also not pushed off to the periphery. It's right there, smack dab in the middle of the cell. All right, so that's one key difference between cardiac muscle and skeletal muscle. Something they have in common, though, is that they both have striation. So you can see the striation or those chains or lines of contractile proteins that actually cause contraction of this muscle cell. Now, the reason they are different in shape between skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle is because they need to contract differently. With skeletal muscle, we need more fine-tuned control, all right, because that's the muscles that are allowing you to move in your body. So you might only want, like, a few of those muscle fibers to fire at the same time. So their muscle fibers are not directly attached to each other. Instead, they're just parallel lines of those fibers. So some of those fibers can contract, others might not. 
Well, cardiac muscle, that's not the case. Cardiac muscle, if one muscle cell fires or contracts, you want all of them to contract. If not, you would only have certain parts of your heart contracting at, at a time and other parts not contracting. And your heart wouldn't act as one single unit when you need your heart to work as one single unit in order to pump blood effectively. So that is why they're designed this way. They have these kind of finger-like projections right, that are sticking out. So if this is one skeletal or cardiac muscle cell right here, and this is another one, they will connect at these finger-like projections. So if this muscle cell contracts, it will cause this one to contract too. And so you, and you have this kind of network that you're creating because one cell could be attached to many other cells. And so when one muscle cell contracts, it creates this kind of brush fire effect that will cover the whole heart and eventually the whole heart's um, muscle cells will contract all together. All right, so that's why they have these kind of finger-like projections. Um, so we have terms for where one cell meets the other cell. So you can see right here, this little darker line is the overlap of two of these fingers off of these cells. These are called intercalated discs, and they're going to have a lot of desmosomes associated with it. They can have tight junctions associated with it, things that are going to be needed to pass the contraction action from one cell to another. And it also keeps them together. So when this contracts, this one doesn't just get pulled away. This one will go with it and then contract as well. All right, so when you first put the cardiac muscle slide on, this is what it's going to look like. Um, again, it doesn't look like much. Uh, there's a couple of things you can take away from this, this uh, level of um, magnification is look at the nuclei. They're kind of spread throughout. They're not in organized lines, and that's because they're not pushed off to the periphery of the cell, and they're in the center of the cells, and there's only one per cell. Um, something else I want to bring to your attention, too, that you might see, you need to ignore stuff like this. This is scar tissue. Okay, it's over here that we're having cardiac tissue. And you're probably going to see a lot of scar tissue on the slides that we get because the, you're looking at real human heart slides. This was some, from somebody who donated their body to education. Um, so you can imagine they're probably an old person. The older you get, the more scar tissue you develop around your heart. Um, so you probably will see a lot of scar tissue associated with it. So try to ignore that. But when you zoom in, again, this is a little further up in magnification, you can still have to keep on zooming, but when you zoom all the way in, then you'll see the striations, all right? That's another good indication you're looking at cardiac muscle. You should also see the single nuclei per cell, and you should see intercalated discs. And intercalated discs are also great for identifying, or identifying cardiac muscle because it, you won't see that in skeletal muscle. Here is scar tissue again, just to give you a, a close view of what it looks like. Um, it's scar tissue is connective tissue. All right, it's different types of connective tissue, so you're going to see more of a matrix with cells in it than the actual cell, whole cell here. All right, and then the last muscle tissue is smooth muscle. You probably guess where it got this name from. You don't see striation here. All right, they have contractile proteins like the other muscle tissue does. However, they're not organized in perfect lines like that, so you don't get that striating pattern um, like the other cells. Um, similar to the cardiac muscle cells, you're only going to have a single nucleus, so they're uninucleated, and that nucleus is going to be right in the middle of the cells. Um, but what's different from this tissue versus the other two is the shape of the cells. So the cells make this spindle shape. At least that's what your textbook and lab bang are going to say. It's spindle shape. By spindle, we mean big in the middle, tapered off on the edges. All right, so think of it that way. Um, I personally think it looks like flames. I think that's a good way to think about it and to make it easy to identify. If you see little flames, you're probably looking at smooth muscle. But again, no striations, uninucleated. All right, so again, these are this is the involuntary muscle. Um, so cardiac is involuntary too. We don't think about it, but these are also involuntary. Um, your, your organs are going to work on their own without you having to think about it. Um, so you need to find this layer of tissue. So you're going to go to the tra um, trachea and the jejunum to see these, because again, you're going to find them in hollow organs. Um, so for the trachea, it's going to be right outside the hyaline cartilage. So way up here would probably be the pseudostratified, then a couple other tissue layers in the hyaline cartilage will right outside that. Then you'll find the smooth muscle layer. And in the jejunum, um, it's going to be one of the outermost layers here. Okay, So you're going to have to go down a couple tissue layers to see it. Um, one other thing I do need to mention too, it's going to be on your list of things to identify. Um, you need to know the difference between uh, circular and longitudinal uh, smooth muscle. Most organs have two smooth muscle layers associated with it, and the muscle cells run in different directions. So this whole 
uh, layer right here we call the muscularis layer. That is the smooth muscle layer. That can be broken down into the circular layer, which is here, usually closer to the lumen, and the longitudinal layer here, which is further away from the lumen. The circular layer, the cells go with the circumference of the organ, while the longitudinal goes the length of the organ. So here the cells are actually coming at you, while here you're looking at the side of the cell. All right, and with these two different directions, it gives your um, organ uh, the ability to move in more three-dimensional space. So with the jejunum, for example, these muscles might be contracting to shrink the jejunum and help with digestion, mechanical digestion, while the longitudinal are probably helping the food move along the length of that jejunum. So make sure you can identify the two layers, but just remember which one's closer to the lumen and which one's further away from the lumen. All right, next one is nervous tissue. Nervous tissue is really easy. There's only two cells involved with nervous tissue. There's neurons and there's neuroglial cells. Here is a neuron, they're huge, and then all these little tiny cells around it are neuroglial cells. Neuroglial cells are there to support the neuron in many different ways. All right, they support the neuron by giving it nutrition, by giving it ATP. They support the neuron by creating myelin sheaths around the axon. So all of that is being made by the neuroglial cells which gives the neuron the ability to just focus on sending action potential, which is the electrical impulse that moves down these cells for communication. All right, so there's different parts to the neuron. We have our cell body, which is the main part of the neuron. This is where you can find all the organelles, including the nucleus. You have these branches or these projections that are coming in to the cell body. This is your dendrite, so this is information coming into the cell. And then we have a single long axon going out that is sending information or electrical impulse out that way. And then eventually they're gonna have an axon terminal somewhere at the end of the axon. And that axon terminal will make a junction with either an effector or the dendrite of the next neuron. And that is how information is being sent. So let's say we have action potential coming down this neuron of some um, neuron over here. It'll reach the action or the axon terminal, which will make a junction with the dendrite here. So action potential will then come into the cell through the dendrite, then go through the cell body, and then go down the axon to the next neuron or to whatever the effector might be, whether it's a gland or a muscle. All right, so those are the parts of the neuron, but I don't expect you to be able to identify all those just yet, um, mostly because there's different shapes to neurons. Not all neurons look exactly like that, where you can clearly see a dendrite and you can clearly see an axon. Sometimes the dendrites and axons look the same, and this is a good example of that. You cannot really tell a dendrite from axon because this is a different type of neuron. So for practical, um, if I'm ever pointing to something like this and ask you name this structure, all you have to say is axon. All right, so that is just an axon. Don't worry about dendrites just yet. However, if I do point to this structure, I think you should be able to identify that one. That's just the cell body, and you can see the nucleus inside the cell body. And then all these other little ones out here are your neuroglial cells. Um, sometimes just referred to as glial cells, um, neuroglia is just being more specific. Um, neuroglia cells are there to support all these neurons. So neurons can focus on just sending action potential and neuroglia cells will do everything else. All right, and then the last slide that we need to look at for tissue is where um, the nervous tissue meets muscle tissue. All right, so nervous tissue usually terminates either at a muscle or a gland. We're not gonna worry about glands in lab, we're just gonna focus on muscle. So we call this the neuromuscular junction. All right, so if you break down that word, neuro referring to nervous tissue, muscular referring to muscular tissue, and they're making a junction. All right, that's where they're meeting. That's what junction means. All right, so what you're looking at here is the end of a neuron, okay? This is the axon of a neuron coming down. So axons can branch. And so you're going to branch with this axon, and each of these branches of the axon will have an axon terminal. So here's your axon terminal here, the very end of this neuron. And this axon terminal is making a junction with one of these skeletal muscle cells. And hopefully everybody identified that as skeletal muscle. They're very long and striated. All right, so how this all works is that at your axon terminal, you have all these little vesicles there. And if you remember, vesicles are just those storage organelles. Inside these vesicles are neurotransmitters. All right, so little chemicals that are stored inside these vesicles. Well, when action potential or an electrical impulse comes down this axon and goes all the way down to the axon terminal, it causes one of these vesicles to pop or, or release that neurotransmitter through exocytosis. So that vesicle will go to the surface of the neuron, release the neurotransmitters, which are tons of chemicals, and then those chemicals will interact 
with the skeletal muscle. And when that happens, that will initiate a contraction in that skeletal muscle. So that's how we're able to think and then move. Our thinking is that electrical impulse from your brain being sent down these neurons to these um, muscle tissue. And then once that neurotransmitter reaches the muscle tissue, then all those contractile proteins will shrink that muscle. And so that's how that whole process works. So just be um, familiar with all the structures to the neuron. Uh, we have our axon, we have axon terminals, we have vesicles with neurotransmitter in them. And where the um, neuron and the muscle cell meet, we call the neuromuscular junction. Okay, so um, you will need to know the different names for the different layers that are in the trachea and jejunum. That's going to be on the list of things to identify. Um, I will do that with you in lab together when you're looking at these slides. Um, they're just special names that we have for the different types of tissue that we have. All right, we have our epithelium. Um, we have submucosa. Um, epithelial layer is usually called the mucosa. That's why the connective tissue underneath it is usually referred to as the submucosa. We have the muscularis layer. That's the muscle layer. Um, that's made up of circular and longitudinal muscle. Um, so again, I'll go over that with you in lab together. So I'm going to go ahead and move on to the integumentary system now. Uh, for integumentary system, I do have slides for you to look at. We're probably going to go back, or actually, we're going to go back to the skeletal, or the excuse me, the um, scalp slides to see that. But I also have the models for everybody to look at too, which makes it nice and easy and pretty. You will have to be able to identify these structures on both, um, not just one or the other. All right, so starting with your tegment, it is an organ, all right? Your skin is an organ, okay? It is made up of multiple tissue layers that are working together to give you this protection and the thing to excrete and make things with, okay? So here's your, mul or your tissue layers. We have three major tissue layers to your integument. One is the epidermis, which is way up here. That is your epithelial layer. That is going to be made up of that stratified squamous cells. Underneath that, we have our dermis. The dermis is the biggest layer. It is mostly made up of connective tissue, so extracellular matrix, and it's going to house all the parts of cells, whether it's muscles, whether it's glands, whether it's hair follicles, all that will be uh, housed inside that dermis. And then below all that is our hypodermis, and our hypodermis is adipose tissue. So your skin constantly needs a supply of adipose, or it needs a constant supply of energy, which is going to come from the adipose, because remember, fat is energy storage. Okay, so make sure you can identify those three layers to integument, so the epidermis, the dermis, and the hypodermis. But you're also going to have to identify some derivatives of um, the integument, that derivatives just to other parts to your skin, like hair, um, nails, stuff like that. There's um, the glands that are associated with the Okay, um, so things that you're responsible for identifying, one, um, with the epidermis, that epithelial layer, there are multiple, we have names for each of the stratifications that happen with that stratified squamous. There is two layers or two stratum that you need to be able to identify. One is the stratum base cell, which you may be able to guess where that is. The stratum base cell is that bottom layer that's directly touching the basement membrane that undergoes mitosis. And then the other one you need to identify is called the stratum corneum. You're going to see the word cornu a lot in the anatomy. It means horns, like bull horns. Um, this is that dead skin cell layer on top, and it gets its name because that keratin that's left behind leaves a really jagged edge at the very top of your skin. So that's why it's called the stratum corneum, horn-like. Um, as far as the dermis goes, these are the things that you need to identify. So you need to identify sudoriferous glands, which are your sweat glands. And you need to identify the sebaceous glands, which is, makes your sebum or oil. You also need to identify erector pili muscles. These are the muscles that are going to allow your hair to stand on end when we have goosebumps. And you have to identify a hair follicle. And I suggest everybody identifies a hair follicle first, because from there you can find two of these things. All right, every erector pili muscle and sebaceous gland is associated with a hair follicle. Pseudoriferous is the only one that's kind of an exception that's out on its own. And then finally, the hypodermis, just be able to identify that is that fat adipose layer. All right, so here is the epidermis and dermis under the slide again. Um, if I zoom in to that dermis, excuse me, uh, here, that bottom layer of cells from the stratification that's touching the base membrane, that is your stratum base cell, it's the mitotic layer. And if you go all the way to the top, all these dead 
keratin or dead cells that left behind that, or the, excuse me, the dead cells that left behind keratin up here that are making this really jagged edge up here. That is your stratum corneum. All right. Um, then if you get into the dermis, then you're going to start seeing some of the parts to um, the dermis that you need to identify. So here is your sudoriferous glands. These are your sweat glands. These are not associated with the hair follicle. They're just kind of spread throughout your dermis randomly, and they'll have a tube that goes all the way to the surface of the skin, and that's how it's secreting. So this is an exocrine gland. Um, these kind of stump students every once in a while because of their shape. So you can kind of think of your pseudoriferous glands like a curled up snake, all right? That's kind of how they sit. It's a very long tube that winds around itself before it becomes a duct going to the surface of the skin. So if you take a cross section of that, think about a curled up snake and taking a cross section of that and what it'd actually look like. Um, you'd probably just see little lobes of where the tube was, right? So that's what you're seeing here is the little lobes. So the tube may have been coming this way and then folding back over this way. And just think of that wrapped up tube right there. So this is what it's going to look like when you see pseudoriferous glands. You're going to see little lobes everywhere where that curled up gland was. And if you're lucky, you may even see part of the duct that was going to the surface. Now that duct is very thin. The chances of them getting in it, it in a cut on a slide is very slim. Um, so you may or may not get that. All right, one of the other things you need to do for your pseudoriferous glands, and please say pseudoriferous, do not say sweat. We're going to use the proper anatomical terms here. Um, try to identify the type of cells that you see there, okay? What kind, if you remember, this is epithelial tissue, right? Epithelium is gland, okay? It's not just border lining, there is gland epithelium. Well, if you look close enough, this is actually simple cuboidal cells, all right? Here's the lumen of the tube. Here's the basement membrane surrounding it. It looks hard, it's kind of hard to see because it's really hard to get this really nice clean cut of this stuff but this is a simple cuboidal epithelium. Okay. All right, so everything else, first identify hair follicle and that will lead you to these other two structures, okay? Hair follicles are really easy in my opinion. Here is a hair follicle here. You can even see the little hair going to the surface. Here is another hair follicle though. Your hair does not grow perfectly 90 degrees to the surface of your skin. All right, they kind of grow at different angles. So the chances of them getting a perfectly thin slice of your skin that has the hair follicle reaching the surface on that slide, there's, it's not a good chance that's going to happen. So this is usually what you're going to see here. This was probably the hair follicle coming at you. So imagine hair follicle coming at you and they took a cross section of it. So you're just kind of seeing inside the hair follicle now. All right, but if you can identify these as hair follicles, you'll find everything else. Okay, so the um, thing we're talking about now is your sebaceous gland. That's your oil gland. Sebum is oil. Your sebaceous glands are always going to dump oil into a hair follicle, and then that oil follows your hair outwards into your skin to nourish the top layer of your skin. All right, so here it is right here, dumping into this hair follicle. Here's one right here that was probably dumping into this hair follicle. Um, these look different than the sudoriferous glands. They kind of look like a brain, in my opinion, like brain matter almost. Here's one um, zoomed in. So it doesn't make a curled up tube. It actually makes a sac that hangs off of your hair follicle and then dumps oil into that hair follicle. All right, so again, I want everybody to know the type of epithelium that is being used here for the sebaceous gland. Can you guess what epithelium this is? So this is the sac right here. Now remember, you're seeing a cross section of the sac. And how do we identify epithelium? We have to look at the side of the cell, right? Well, here's the sides of the cell right here. These are the tops of the cells of the back part of the sac. Here's the sides of the cells of the sides of the sac. All right, very hard to see. And that's because it is simple squamous. Your pseudoriferous glands are a type of simple squamous epithelium. So just giving you an idea of why it's so hard to see simple squamous under a microscope and why we looked at the tops of the frog skin in order to identify simple squamous. All right, here's more hair follicles. This is just the very tip of some. All right, they're probably coming at you or away from you when it got cut. That's why it's not going straight to the surface. And then around it is just sebaceous gland. I think it looks like a brain. All right, it's these little sacs that are around your hair follicle that are going to really sieve them into the hair follicle. And then the last structure that you need to identify is called the erector pili muscle. This is also going to be associated with hair follicles. All right, these erector pili muscles are what's going to cause your hair to stand on end. Now, can you look closely enough at this image and can you identify what type of muscle tissue that is? 
all right? That is smooth muscle, okay? So being smooth muscle, is this voluntary or involuntary? So this is gonna be involuntary muscle. We don't think about it, it just works, okay? Well, when this muscle contracts, the smooth muscle, when it contracts, it makes your hair stand on end and gives you goosebumps. All right, so we consider this a vestigial trait in humans. Um, we still have them, even though we don't really use it anymore. But other animals, like um, the great apes, um, it is relative to their survival. So what happens is that when you think about when you get goosebumps, you get goosebumps when either you're cold or you're scared. Well, if you're scared as an ape and you contract your erector pili muscles, it will make all your hair stand on end. And what did that effectively do? Well, it made you look bigger all right, and more intimidating. All right, so we still do that even though we don't have that hair anymore. We've lost our, our hair over evolutionary time. Um, the other thing it does is that when you're cold, all right, these will contract, all that hair will stand on end, and so now you have this bigger layer of hair from the outside environment and your skin, which makes it harder for the heat to be lost through that hair. All right, so it's harder for that cold air to suck out that heat because you have such a bigger um, fur layer when your hair is standing on end. All right, so that's why it also happens when you're cold because it helps insulate. Again, vestigial in us, we don't have that hair, so it doesn't really help us with the cold, even though we still have this visceral reaction to cold with these erector pili muscles. All right, so make sure you can identify them. They're always going to be um, associated with the hair follicle, and they're usually found right outside the um, sebaceous gland. All right, so here's the sebaceous gland here. Here's the erector pili muscle probably to this hair follicle. All right, and that's it for all the slides and everything that we need to cover for the uh, tissue part two integument. All right, so for when we meet in class, since you've already watched these videos, we could just jump right into looking at slides. I won't need to talk about anything. Um, I'll still have these PowerPoints up for you to look at if you want help as you go through this stuff, but we're just gonna jump right into slides when we get into lab. All right, um, I thank you everybody for being understanding about this. It's just bad timing with me getting sick. Um, I met a lot of new people this week, so it's almost an inevitability. Uh, but hopefully everybody is understanding about this and um, hopefully this works out pretty well. I think this will work out with you learning the stuff from these videos and then we're just coming in and looking at slides. All right, everybody take care um, and have a great weekend.